And uh, my default worldview is a materialist, not yeah. non supernatural anything. Yep. Um, so I have to choose to actively think outside of that default. The Bible asks us to believe a lot of strange things about the spiritual world. At first we might be tempted to ignore them, but if we say we believe the Bible, we can't avoid these concepts. I don't find this easy to believe. Yeah. Like this isn't natural for me to... So I'm choosing to say I think these biblical authors and Jesus have a way of viewing the world that they can see something that I guess I can't see. Yeah. There's something I'm blind to about how they view reality and that this is a really important part of understanding what's going on. There's three rebellions. There's three that led to contribute to why the world is the way it is. It's not just the garden of Eden. It's bigger than that. Welcome to another episode of Ring Them Bells. We're starting a brand new series going over Jesus versus the powers of the three rebellions. Starting here today, we're gonna have our episode one, not one, but three falls, understanding these three rebellions and introducing them. Uh, why is this world so messed up? Is it just because Adam and Eve made that decision and listened to the snake? Or is there more to the story? Why did Jesus come to this earth? Is it just because of your personal sin? Or is there more to the story? This episode is gonna help connect you with the Jewish narrative of scripture to understand that we have not one fall, but three in the form of three rebellions in Genesis. Uh, starting out with Eden, going through Genesis 6, all the way to the Tower of Babel, we have a crisis on our hands and we need a savior. This series is gonna point us to the hope that we have in Jesus and how he fixes all three of these rebellions. So I hope you guys are subscribed. I hope you guys are ready. We've got some great scholars lined up that are gonna blow your mind. Let's get started. If you asked the average Christian, why is the world so wicked? Why is humanity so depraved? Why is the world the mess that it is, okay? The answer you're gonna invariably get is the fall, okay? The fall. The fall gets blamed for everything. If you asked an Israelite or a first century Jew the same question, hey, why is the world so wicked? Why is the world such a mess? Why do we have this chaos and suffering and so on and so forth, you know, sin? That is not the answer you would get. The Israelite and the first century Jew would not just say, well, it's the fall, Genesis 3. The answer you would get is, well, there's actually three reasons why the world is the way it is. The first one is the fall. They would acknowledge that. The fall is the entrance of rebellion into God's good world, both on a supernatural level, because we have a supernatural being that decides to interfere and impede with what God wants for humanity in Genesis. But there are also two other rebellions. There are two other reasons why the world is the way it is. And these other two reasons, you have a rebellion in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, with the sons of God, and you have what happens at Babel. Unfortunately, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a little bit as to why this is in a moment, but again, it's been my experience that the second one of these, the sons of God episode, is regularly either ignored in the church or demythologized. Uh, it's explained away as something other than a supernatural rebellion. So you never get this part of the Israelite Jewish worldview. The Genesis 6 episode is a huge deal in intertestamental literature, which bleeds into the New Testament because the New Testament writers are part of what we call the second temple period. You get the temple rebuilt after the return from exile, all the way into 70 AD when it's destroyed again. That period, the New Testament is part of that. What happens in Genesis 6 is a really, really big deal. 
in their view of depravity that overspreads the earth. So if we sort of don't have that one count, <clears throat> if we sort of remove that from the picture, we, we miss some significant elements to not only understand certain things in the New Testament, but also certain things in the Old. The third one, Babel, this is a Sunday school story that everybody knows. I didn't run into Deuteronomy 32, 8, and 9 until I was a doctoral student as far as what in the world is going on there. And part of the reason is because our modern English translations do not utilize the Dead Sea Scrolls in those verses and in other verses in Deuteronomy 32 as well. So we never see what the text originally had there and why it's important because Paul and others dip into Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9 with a fair amount of regularity. And that passage is the foundation for what we today loosely call spiritual warfare. But you'll never see it unless, again, you have like the Dead Sea Scrolls to help you. You'll never see it. Even though Paul alludes to it in Acts 17, you'll just never see it. You won't, it'll look like what Paul's saying has no context for it, like he's just making something up. Because I can't find that in the Old Testament. Again, it's a textual issue, it's a manuscript issue. But all three of these, again, would be the Israelite Jewish explanation for why the world is the mess that it is. And so ultimately the Messiah isn't, he doesn't just have to deal with what happened in the Garden of Eden, does he? The Messiah has to deal with the corruption brought by the watchers in Genesis 6. You've got to fix that problem too. <laughs> See, the Genesis 3 problem is about the fact that now that you've aligned yourself to the Nakash, and I've cast the Nakash down to the realm of the dead, you went with him. He, in effect, owns your soul. You will die, and you will not be in relationship to me. You are not only cast out of the garden, there is no more Eden. You are not only going to die mortally, but you will be forever separated from me. That's a problem. God wants to fix that. So that's what needs to be fixed out of Genesis 3. What needs to be fixed out of Genesis 6 is human depravity, just generally, broadly speaking. And what happens to be fixed, or what needs to be fixed out of Genesis 11 is the Messiah is not just the Messiah to the Jew only. I want every nation back into the fold. Every tongue, every language, every race, every you know, fill in the blank, it all has to come back full circle to me. So we've got three rebellions that the Messiah needs to take care of, not just one. And if you have that in, in, you know, in, your, in your head, you will read certain passages. And again, some bells and whistles will go off. The authors of scripture believed the gods of the nations were real. Look at Psalm 82 carefully. God stands in the divine assembly. He administers judgment in the midst of the gods. When you really look at Psalm 82, 1, it's kind of shocking. But there it is, plain as day. God presides over an assembly of gods that he calls his sons. We're just not used to thinking of the heavenly host in those terms, but that's what the Hebrew text says. Psalm 89 says the same thing about God's counsel in the heavens. A God feared greatly in the counsel of the holy ones. The Hebrew word translated gods in Psalm 82 is Elohim. Now most of the time it should be translated as capital G, God, but sometimes it's plural. And Psalm 82, one has both. The problem for us is that we think this is a problem for monotheism, but it's not. We're taught to associate the letters G, O, and D with a specific set of unique attributes. That's why putting an S on the end makes us queasy. But the word Elohim is not about a set of unique attributes. The Bible itself tells us that. Elohim is simply a word used to describe 
a supernatural being. It says nothing, nothing about attributes. That's why the biblical writers used Elohim for other spirit beings besides God. It's used for the gods of the nations. It's used for demons. It's used for angels, uh, even the disembodied human dead. However, Yahweh is one of those Elohim and no other Elohim is like him. I repeat, no other Elohim is like him. The Bible describes him in unique ways. There is only one of him, one of him, existing as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he is the creator of all other Elohim. was the home and headquarters of God. His supernatural and earthly families resided there. God wanted them to image him in their own ways. Heaven and earth blended together into one family, but one family member didn't like that idea. We've all heard about the serpent in Eden, but why a serpent? What's that supposed to tell us? Ancient people knew how to take this scene, but we don't. We assume the serpent is merely an animal. His form is important, but the story is not about zoology. The story is about a supernatural rebellion. Isaiah alludes to that rebellion. I will raise up my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mountain of assembly. I will make myself like the Most High. Isaiah is talking about the sons of God in the assembly. Just like Job, he refers to them as stars. They were present before Eden. Ezekiel 28 mentions the rebellion in Eden as well. In Ezekiel's case, a guardian cherub gets kicked out of Eden. You were an anointed guardian cherub, and I placed you on God's holy mountain. You walked in the midst of stones of fire. Ancient Mesopotamian tablets talk about cherub throne guardians and describe them as snakes and dragons. The Serpent of Eden was actually a supernatural being whose job was to guard God's throne. An ancient person would have known the scene was about a rebel in the Divine Council. Fall, of course, we're familiar with. I view this as a divine rebellion story. That doesn't mean that, you know, Adam wasn't there and Adam didn't sin and, you know, Adam's sin really had a, a profound impact on humanity. Of course, all those things are, are kind of no-brainers. But you would be amazed at how many evangelical Old Testament scholars do not want to put too much emphasis on the Nakash, the serpent figure, in the story and absolutely refuse to look at Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 as having anything to do with that story. Now, there are academic scholarly reasons for that. And I, I will, since I'm being recorded, let me be careful. That's nonsense, okay? <laughs> All right. There are really good academic reasons to not resist those connections. There's a lot that connects the three. But here you have Nakash, you have serpent language, you have Halal ben Shakar, the shining language, brought down, cut down, cast down, the earth, the Eretz, which is another word for the underworld, Sheol, okay, Rephaim, Malachim, okay. All of these terms, again, they, they, they all show up in all three of these passages. And scholars will, will recognize that Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 are connected. I mean, all you gotta do is read them. You know, they're, they kind of sound the same. Just one, you know, Isaiah is, is the prince of Babylon and Ezekiel is the prince of Tyre and all this kind of stuff. My argument is at the, back, at the back of both of these passages, these passages aren't about Eden or about Genesis 3. But that story is in the background to both of them. And the story is a story of divine rebellion. It's of a cosmic spiritual rebellion. Yeah. They see a spiritual rebel and a human rebel together. together. And the biblical authors don't use this worldview to excuse human beings. Like, oh, a devil made yeah. them do it. That's totally not the... It's that we are partnering, unbeknownst to ourselves, 
we buy into these cultural systems or these personal stories of redefining good and evil by our own wisdom. And without even knowing it, we can become partners with forces of evil and chaos that are so beyond our ability to comprehend. And, and we can even think that we're doing the right thing. Wow. When in fact, we are redefining evil as good. That's what the biblical authors want us to see. Yes. And so let's just pause. That's so profound. If you haven't yet, please subscribe, like, share, turn on the alerts for this channel. All those things help us get the message out about what God has done for this world. And we're so excited to have you here along for the journey. We've got more coming. Genesis 6 describes the second supernatural rebellion. Some of the sons of God, members of the heavenly council, transgress the boundary between heaven and earth. The sons of God saw the daughters of humankind, that they were beautiful. The Nephilim were upon the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God went into the daughters of humankind and they bore children to them. So an important way that biblical literature works is the biblical authors plant these seed ideas and themes in the first few pages of Genesis. And then they, what they start to do is play out the biblical story in what we call design patterns. We made a video about it for the Bible Project or cycles so that later biblical stories are told uh, to in a, such a way as to resemble earlier stories, but often inverting them in, in creative ways. And so the sons of God in Genesis 6 is a great example. Um, in Genesis 3, you have a woman talking to a spiritual being, and what we're told is she sees what is good in her eyes, and she takes what she wants for herself under the direction of a spiritual being. And what happens then is that humans, along with the spiritual beings, are exiled from the heaven on earth place down into the realm of, of death and mortality. So when you get to Genesis 6, what you have is the exact inversion of Genesis 3. Genesis 6 is about the heavenly beings trying, going out of their proper realm of authority and trying to seize and take power um, and take, take women uh, on the earthly realm. Does that make sense? They're exactly the mm -hmm. inverse of each other. The answer lies in the offspring produced by the forbidden union between the sons of God and the women in Genesis 6. Those offspring were known as the Nephilim. They were giants. Their descendants became the giant clans Moses and Joshua battled. Come. Let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top reaches to the heavens. And Yahweh said, Come, let us go down and confuse their language there, so that they will not understand each other's language. Therefore, its name was called Babel. Now this is a really familiar story. But less familiar is how the story is told in Deuteronomy. When the Most High apportioned the nations, at his dividing up the sons of humankind, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. For Yahweh's portion was his people, Jacob the share of his inheritance. When was humanity divided into nations? That was at Babel. God allotted the nations to the members of his divine council. The Bible says this is why the ancient nations worshiped other gods. God decided to let the members of his divine council govern the other nations in response to humanity's rebellion at Babel. But the gods of the nations failed to rule justly. God chastises them in Psalm 82. God stands in the divine assembly. He administers judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show favoritism to the wicked? then God pronounces a judgment on them. I have said, you are gods and sons of the Most High, all of you. However, you will die like men and you will fall like one of the princes. The gods will be judged, punished, and will die. It's startling to read these things. 
God is so angry with his corrupt heavenly sons that he condemns them. Some passages in the prophets place the fulfillment of this punishment in the end times at the day of the Lord. For the anger of Yahweh is against all the nations, and his wrath is against all their host. All the host of heaven shall rot, all their host shall wither. On that day, Yahweh will punish the host of heaven in heaven, and the kings of the earth on the earth. reasons why the world is the way it is and why it's so bad. For sure, there's the fall. I mean, something did happen in Eden. We have the initial rebellion into God's good world. Um, we have an initial transgression, both divine rebellion, the Nakash, the serpent, and also a human rebellion. But that is not where the story ends. And typically, that is where the story ends for your average Christian. That's, that's the, only, the, the only answer they have in their head. But to someone else, they would say, the, the, what happened in Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is also really serious. Because in their worldview, they believe that the sin of the watchers, the sin of the sons of God of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, had a direct impact on why humanity became as bad as it did and why the flood was a necessity and why there's still an ongoing problem. So they would include Genesis 6, 1 through 4 in their concept of depravity. They would also refer to the judgment at Babel, which we're familiar with because of Genesis 11, but I would, I would dare say that if you've ever heard a sermon or had a Sunday school lesson on the Tower of Babel, you probably never heard Deuteronomy 32, 8, and 9 brought into the picture. Therefore, you never really learn the rationale for what happens at Babel and, and the impact that has on biblical theology in, in, in a very broad scope. And as far as what, again, pun intended, I'm so clever, the fallout of the three rebellions, the three falls, if you will. The first one, what that incurs to humanity is estrangement from God and death. Romans 5, 12, wherefore so by one man sin into the world and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men. By the way, it doesn't say guilt there. It says death. Death passed upon all men. So we have an estrangement from God and we have a death problem. The second one is viewed again by Second Temple period Jews as a root cause of the proliferation of depravity. It's not that humans aren't depraved because they fell in Genesis 3. They, they, it was, these were willful acts of rebellion. And you have plenty of other willful acts of sin that, that ensue from it. But Genesis 6 was thought to be about the proliferation, the acceleration of depravity among human beings. And in the Old Testament period, it was a lethal threat that arose from this event to the people of God as the people of God were known then, the Israelites. And the third one is really about abandonment and fragmentation of God, and not only God to the rest of humanity besides Israel, but really all of the nations from each other, and especially to God. Now, if you were a Second Temple period Jew, and your, your answer to why the world is the, is the mess that it is, were these three things, you expect the Messiah to cure all three problems, not just one. Wow, how incredible is this? I hope you guys are enjoying this and I hope you're learning a lot. I wanna ask you for a second to subscribe. Uh, if you're enjoying the content, share it, like, press that like button, slap it. Uh, help this channel grow, help the message of the good news of what Jesus has done for this world get out. Uh, you're a part of this community with me. I always say we, uh, and really it's just me behind the camera, but I've got you guys as support, encouragement, and you're here for the ride, and I'm so grateful for you. So thank you for subscribing. Thank you for liking. Thank you for sharing the content, and thank you for being a part of this journey with me.